you're watching RTE One, we bring you now the final part of the documentary series chronicling the events surrounding the 1798 rebellion. By the 9th of June, the United Irishmen of Ulster were massing a second time around Scrabo Hill in North Down. The Antrim campaign under Henry Joy McCracken had been defeated, but here under Scrabo were 10,000 more men in arms. The United Army moved inland and occupied the town of Saintfield. they elected a leader, Henry Munro, an Episcopalian linen merchant from Lisburn. Then the force moved south from Saintfield to Ballinahinch and camped on Edna Vaddy Hill. On Edna Vaddy, a preacher quoted the book of Ezekiel to a largely Presbyterian army. Cause them that have charge of the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. It was the last camp of the Ulster Rebellion for all the world, like a great Presbyterian meeting. We have a very, very clear, very graphic account of it by a man who, when he was a boy of 12, had accompanied his mother and aunts to the field at Edna Vadney. The eye was presented with a mixed and motley multitude. Some walking about, others stretched on the green turf along the field or sheltering themselves from the scorching sun under the shade of the trees. They wore no uniforms, yet they presented a decent appearance being dressed, no doubt, in their Sunday clothes. They all concurred in the wearing of green. The army was chiefly composed of persons in youth or middle life. By far the majority had pikes, others wore old swords. There were a considerable number of females, daughters or wives of small farmers. The leaders were everywhere moving through the field, speaking familiarly and kindly to the men and cheering their courage. that account I felt it was an extraordinarily Ulster kind of picture. I mean it depicted people that we know, people who are still living in that area today. Because Thompson in his account talks about them being dressed in their Sunday best. Now I know what an Ulsterman means when he dresses in the Sunday best and there's a kind of subculture about it. And it struck me as very remarkable, and even in a sense poignant, that 
Thompson should say this, they were dressed in their Sunday best. It wasn't a question of an ordination of a new minister. The business before the meeting was, shall we separate Ireland from Great Britain? And it was a, an occasion of such seriousness and solemnity that you put on your Sunday suit. The rest of the week you were out in the fields working and so on, but on Sunday you put on your Sunday suit. Well, for the Battle of Balna Hinch, you prepared in your Sunday suit. From the moment Monroe's prospects seemed good, the County Down rebels were confident. But General George Nugent was gathering the government forces for an attack. All Ulster, outside down, was under his control. Reinforcements were pouring into Belfast. And at nine o'clock on the morning of Tuesday, June the 11th, General Nugent's forces left Belfast by the Long Bridge in a column which was fully three miles long. And in the rebel camp at Ballina Hinch, they were able to mark its progress by the plumes of rising smoke from homes and buildings set alight along their route. And they were filled with a certain amount of anxiety and fear. As Nugent's army approached, some of the rebels on the hill deserted. But the Crown troops contented themselves with occupying the town and drinking their fill. As night fell over Ballina Hinge, many rebels urged their general to attack the drunken soldiers under cover of darkness. But Monroe refused, saying it was dishonourable. There were disputes and more desertions. The battle began at 3 a.m. and was to last for 13 hours. United Irish at first pushed Nugent back. But the rebel attack could not be sustained. By midday, the field of Ballina Hinch belonged to General Nugent. Many rebels who survived the battle were executed on the spot. Henry Monroe himself was hanged outside his home in Lisburn. The rebellion in Ulster had lasted just eight days. But in spite of the repression and the bloodshed of the previous 18 months, thousands of men came out in arms and served under the banners of the United Irishmen. And on a couple of occasions, they came near enough to victory. But now the government was firmly in control. Ulster was quiet and Castle and Crown could now turn their attention to Wexford. In Wexford, after initial successes, the rebels had suffered serious defeats and realised their isolation. Much of the county was still theirs. But the tide was turning.
Now, with mounting desperation, the signal fires were lit on the hillsides. Where was Wolf Tone? Where were the French? In Paris, power was shifting once again, away from those who had backed Wolf Tone and the Irish strategy. Carno, the once powerful director for war, had been ousted. General Lazar Osh, Tone's great friend, who had led the massive invasion attempt at Bantry two years earlier, was dead. Now there was a new man in power, one who had been Osha's great rival in the military. Any decision to assist the Irish rebels would be his alone. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte. Once again, Tone lobbied for an invasion of Ireland to advance the French war effort against Britain. But Napoleon was a Mediterranean. Northern Europe didn't greatly interest him. As the Irish rebels watched and waited, he was, in fact, preparing an invasion. But this would be no second bantry. France was going to challenge the British by invading Egypt. No force of any size would be released to Ireland. So, in Wexford, the signal fires died. The rebels moved across the countryside from hill camp to hill camp, sometimes covering 30 miles a day, harrying government forces, then retiring. But they lacked any strategy. In Dublin, the government now marshalled a counter-attack. Once again, General Gerard Lake would take command. He prepared to move south. The word now went out across Republican Wexford to gather at the strongest camp, at Vinegar Hill. The rebels had suffered badly in the towns, but on high ground, drawing government troops and cavalry onto the pike, they believed they were strong. But some rebels, like the 18-year-old Captain Miles Byrne, were unconvinced. I had not seen Vinegar Hill since the 2nd of June, and I was surprised to find that scarcely anything had been done to make it formidable against the enemy. How could our generals for an instant think that Vinegar Hill was a military position susceptible of defence for any time, without provisions, military stores or great guns? In the third week of June, General Lake moved south with 10,000 men to crush the rebellion. With the rebel army on the hill were hundreds of women and children. As Lake came from the north, General Johnson, the victor of New Ross, moved to take the town of Enniscorthy, cutting off support from, or escape to, the west. On the evening of the 20th of June, Lake's army moved to within cannon range of the hilltop. Sis, everyone's delighted you're coming home. Mum's tearing the house apart in your honour. She's even painting your room, though I think that's meant to be a surprise. Remember John O'Brien? He split with his girlfriend, so he's all yours. He was asking for your Friday in O'Shea's. Shep misses you like mad, and Dad says you'd swear he's checking every plane that flies over. 
nothing much else happening. I'm just sitting having a cup of Barry's tea. A bit different from New York, I bet. Lots of love, Angie. Streaming eyes, stuffy head. Dimotap tablets relieve the symptoms of summer colds and hay fever for up to 12 hours. Dimotap. Scrap that brick with Phone Zone. Bring your old mobile phone to your nearest Phone Zone outlet and get a scrappage allowance against a state of the art mobile phone box subject to terms and conditions. Phone 1850 5857560 for your nearest branch. Phone Zone, clearly a better service. Can love endure? Sure. That's why L'Oreal created new color endure stay on mascara. It doesn't smudge, it doesn't flake. Of course, it's L'Oreal. But the real surprise is that a mascara that gives beautiful lashes for up to 24 hours just washes off with soap and water. No more smudging or flaking. And no more compromising. New L'Oreal Color Endure Stay On Mascara. Because I'm worth it. Win a fabulous family trip to Florida with the Larry Gogan Show or motoring holidays worth over £1,500 or a pampered weekend break for two in County Wicklow in this week's all-channel RTE Guide. New Whisper Mint. Delicious Whisper Chocolate with a mouth-watering layer of mint. Oh. New Whisper Mint from Cadbury's. Have you heard the latest whisper? Imagine a power that turns chaos into order, that can shape itself to your needs, that can even create space at your command. The new range of fridge freezers from Whirlpool. It was June 21st, 1798. As the sun rose over Vinegar Hill, 12,000 pikemen took up position, still trusting in their leader's plan. General Lake's forces gathered just below the hill and primed their cannon. The artillery barrage began before dawn on that morning from positions over there. And for half an hour, shot and shell rained down on the unprotected heads of the thousands of people here on Vinegar Hill. They had no defence against it. In fact, in the three weeks in which the United Irish Army had been here on the hill, they hadn't made any adequate defence against any form of attack. And now, they were to suffer for it. What followed was heard clearly in Wexford town, nearly 20 miles away. When the artillery barrage ceased, the ground attack began. The rebels were virtually without guns or ammunition. There could only be one end. By nine o'clock on that morning, the United Irish Army was facing certain defeat and they had to retreat off the hill. And now they were to have the one piece of luck that they were to have all that day. It was Lake's plan to encircle the hill and wipe out the United Army. General Francis Needham was given a key role to move round the hill by the east and cut off any retreat to the south. But Needham moved too slowly. The rebels saw their chance. 
By the time his force came around, the rebels were fleeing south through what became known as Needham's Gap. Most of these soldiers of the United Army managed to escape, but their wounded and their women and their children who ran screaming down off the hill weren't as lucky. They couldn't move as fast, and the pursuing yeomanry cavalry got among them, sabred them, and slaughtered them in droves. A victorious lake wrote to Dublin Castle saying, the rascals put up a tolerable good fight of it, the carnage was dreadful. Like the battle itself, the story of Needham's Gap passed into legend. The general, in fact, wrote to his wife after the battle, saying that he had chosen to let the rebels go. He wished to settle in Ireland after the rebellion, he wrote, and unlike General Lake, he didn't want a bad name among the Irish. I think when, when we come to assess the Battle of Vinegar Hill, um, we have to say two things about it. First of all, it, it wasn't the annihilation that we've often assumed it was, the annihilation of the rebels. They largely got away here. Uh, but at the same time, it's an awfully important turning point because you can say it's the last attempt on the part of the rebel leadership to fight this war as wars are normally fought. It was the last attempt on their part to, to be conventional. It certainly puts paid to any notion any rebel leader had of holding the county of Wexford until the French might arrive. That game, if it ever was a seriously considered game, was, was over once this battle had been fought. The rebellion itself was now all but over. The retreating Wexford army broke into smaller guerrilla bands, dwindling through losses, desertions and exhaustion. For a few weeks more, bands of rebels moved across the southeast, foraging into the South Midlands and even skirting Dublin before finally abandoning the fight. After Vinegar Hill, Wexford Town spent one more day in rebel hands. It was to be a particularly bloody day. With the United leadership gone to Vinegar Hill, a local captain now ordered a mass execution of Loyalist prisoners. This was moved from the quayside to the bridge to allow the public a better view. Of 98 prisoners, only three survived. I and my fellow prisoners knelt down in a row. The blood of those who had already been executed had more than stained. It streamed upon the ground about us. The manner of piking was, by two of the rebels pushing their pikes into the front of the victim while two others pushed pikes into his back. And in this state, writhing with torture, he was suspended aloft on the pikes till dead. He was then thrown over the bridge into the water. Thus they proceeded. The people assembled there almost rent the air with shouts and exultations. The whole sectarian question in 98 in general, and in Wexford in particular, is it's a very troubling question for everybody, I think. I think the first thing we have to say is the United Irishmen did not certainly have a sectarian agenda. And I think when you look at the fighting in Wexford uh, and various aspects of what happens when the rebels in control are, are in control, I don't think that they were attempting to, to carry out any kind of religious uh, war or crusade or anything like that. There are way too many Protestant rebels, way too many Catholic loyalists for us to be able to say that. But the other thing we have to say about the rebellion in Wexford is that it was fought in the 18th century, and the 18th century was still a sectarian century. Everywhere in Europe, uh, in Ireland in particular, and maybe in an area like Wexford that had a fairly substantial Protestant population uh, in particular also. So sectarianism is certainly there. We can't bury it completely, but I think we have to maybe bear in mind that it's not central to the thing. 
The following day, General Lake approached Wexford, ordering a surrender or its destruction. Surrender was given. For Dublin Castle, the crisis had now passed. There was time for a changing of the guard. Lord Camden's mission as Viceroy had been to crush the United Irishman. That had been done. He was replaced by Lord Cornwallis, a more humane figure. Cornwallis had only to mop up the remnants of the uprising. There would be no further surprises or so it seemed. On August the 22nd, a Mayo loyalist looked out into Killala Bay and saw a sight which the British government and Dublin Castle had feared might happen since Bantry two years before, and which the United Irishmen were afraid might never happen at all. He saw three warships beating up the bay, flying the flag of England. But these were vessels which were sailing under false colours. They were, in fact, French men of war, loaded to the gunnels with arms and soldiers. The French moved quickly from Kalala to take the town of Balana, to the great distress of the government. The French army was feared across Europe. The castle's militia and yeomanry would be no match for them. Reports came of uprisings in the Midlands, and it seemed that the whole rebellion might reignite. But the French force was tiny, just a thousand men led by a general of mixed reputation, Jean-Joseph Humbert. He was no Lazar Oche. This would be no second bantry. From Dublin came General Lake. As he approached from the east, the French left Ballina and skirted the lakes and mountains to meet him on their own terms. Castle Bar, a thousand experienced French did what 20,000 ill-trained rebels could not. They forced Lake to flee in disarray. But the end was not far. Viceroy Cornwallis now led 12,000 government troops from Dublin. Humbert fled swiftly across country. As the net closed, Humbert dodged south to try and reach an unguarded Dublin. But at Ballinamuck in Longford, Cornwallis caught him. It was the last set-piece battle on Irish soil. The thousand French were given an honourable surrender. The Irish who fought with them were coursed over the bogs and fields and cut down through the afternoon. Some were taken here to an old rath and hanged from the trees.
maybe 500 died. Five hundred at Ballinamuck, to add to four hundred at Carlo, and the same at Gibbet Rath. More than a hundred at Prosperous and Kilcullen, at Owlet Hill, and at Kilthomas. Three hundred at Antrim, and two hundred at Ballinahinch and Arklow. Three thousand in a morning at New Ross. Two thousand at Vinegar Hill, in spite of the rebel escape and unnumbered others. The mainly loyalist militia and yeomanry now exacted a price for the rebellion. Magistrates, landlords and ascendancy politicians cheered them on. Rebel bodies were brought to Dublin and draped over bridges, hung around lamp standards, displayed in piles in the castle yard and buried in mass pits in the Croppies Acre at the old royal barracks. For the new viceroy, it was a graphic lesson in the hatreds and repression that had fed the rebellion itself. There is no law except martial law in town and country. Numberless murders are hourly committed by our people without any process or examination. The Irish militia are totally without discipline, ferocious and cruel in the extreme when any poor wretches, with or without arms, come within their power. I am much afraid that any man in a brown coat who was found within several miles of the field of action is butchered without discrimination. The 1798 rebellion and the events of that summer up to and after the French arrived I cannot describe otherwise than as an absolute bloodbath. The carnage was really quite appalling. We, us historians, we churn out quite readily the figure 20,000 um, fatalities, 30,000 fatalities, figures that we know are much greater than any of the atrocities that took place under the terror, under Robespierre's terror in France. But I believe them to be much higher. 25 Catholic chapels were torched in Wexford alone in the campaign of vengeance against the population. The oral history of 1798 is almost nil. People didn't want to talk about it. And the military license continues for decades afterwards. People that we know about in the late 19th century whose grandfather had been out say it wasn't talked about at home. People were scared and they were scared way into the 19th century. In an attempt to stem the slaughter, Cornwallis introduced amnesties for the surrender of arms. And in exchange for statements of their involvement, some of the United leadership were given limited jail sentences and exile. Samuel Nielsen was one of those spared. Another was Arthur O'Connor. Other leaders were among thousands who left for America. The lawyer, Thomas Addis Emmett, who had been disbarred and jailed for his political activity, became Attorney General of the State of New York. But others were not so lucky. Henry Joy McCracken, the united leader in Antrim, hid on the Cave Hill before fleeing north to the Port of Lahn in disguise. But he had travelled there before for his family's linen business and was recognised by a former customer. On July the 17th in Belfast, Henry Joy McCracken went to the gallows. In Dublin, the brothers John and Henry Shears had been arrested with incriminating papers. On trial, they were represented and betrayed by the United Irish Council and Castle spy, Leonard McNally. The brothers were half hanged, their innards cut out and burnt while they watched. Then they were cut into pieces and their heads placed.
placed on display. In Wexford, the rebel leaders were being hunted down. Edward Roach, John Kelly of Calam, Father John Murphy, all perished. The elected leader of the Wexford army, Beecham Bagnall Harvey, had quit the fighting after the defeat at New Ross and the horror of Scalabogue. He fled Wexford. Wanted posters were issued as far afield as London and Wales. But Harvey was hiding in a cave on the Salty Islands just off the Wexford coast with his wife, a rebel colleague, a barrel of pork and the family silver. He was discovered by a government patrol. His head was placed on a spike in Wexford town. Wolf Tone left France on the 16th of September and sailed for Ireland with a final naval group. He could have been in little doubt about the likely chances of success, but he had inspired the rebellion and was determined to be there at the finish. He knew when he sailed in that ship that it was going to fail. We can see it in all his writings. He knew he'd be captured. He knew he was probably going to die. And it's really what send, sends him is that intense sense of loyalty and honour to the people, particularly the, the people who were close to him, that he'd become involved with. Tone's fatalism was well founded. At Loch Swilly, the French fleet was intercepted and decimated by the Royal Navy. Tone, identified as Adjutant General Smith, was captured. In Dublin, he was held in the Royal Barracks, now Collins Barracks, and court-martialed like other rebel prisoners. Tone's whole demeanour at that trial wasn't as somebody trying to create a romantic reputation for himself. It was, it, was, it was sad, it was an acceptance. His speech wasn't a kind of declamatory, um, you know, I set out to rescue Ireland from tyranny type thing. It wasn't. And indeed, there's a major passage in that speech that says, I know that great atrocities have been carried out by both sides in this rebellion. I'm sorry for it. This wasn't the way it was intended. And you, you just get a sense that he knows things have gone wrong and really he's looking for the honorable way out. As a French army officer, Tone believed he was due a military execution, but the sentence was public hanging. In an apparent show of respect, Viceroy Cornwallis struck out the provision that Tone's head be publicly displayed afterwards. The prisoner did not intend to die as a criminal, yet as he made his final plans, his friends outside appealed the judgment of the military court and succeeded. Because the sentence had been passed and Tone was supposed to have been brought out that morning to be hanged, a special government attaché was sent to the prison that morning and demanded entry and demanded possession of, of the prisoner tone for retrial. And it was then they were told that he had committed suicide. In the barracks, Wolf Tone had cut his throat, but crudely. It took him seven days to die of infection. It was not yet two years since Tone had been to Bantry with 15,000 men of Osha's fleet. If the French had landed then, the evidence suggests that events would almost certainly have taken a different course. This is my old kitchen, and I'm bored with it. This is Ronsil Paint and Grain. It's called paint and grain because all you do is paint on the base coat, slap on the top coat, comb, 
and grain. Easy. And it works on most surfaces. So, if you fancy a change, use Ron Seal paint and grain. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Lovely. Is that Mummy? And is that Daddy in the hot air balloon? Oh. Daddy is the hot air balloon. Uh, we're needing these then. Kellogg's Brown Flakes are now called HealthWise with Body Balanced Nutrition because no other cereal provides a better balance of the things your body needs. Fantastic. What more does a man need to stay fit and healthy? <laughs> Kellogg's HealthWise Brown Flakes. A step in the right direction. A great new Stripe toothpaste from Colgate. It's new Colgate Total Fresh Stripe. It has a great minty taste and a unique antibacterial formula that keeps on helping to protect you against bad breath, plaque, tartar, cavities and gum disease long after you finish brushing. In fact, its green and white stripes will keep on working for up to 12 hours. New Colgate Total Fresh Stripe outstrips other stripes. Carte noire. Try to remember when life was so tender and dreams were kept beside your pillow and follow, follow. Carte noire. Un café nommé désir. Finnish Double Action Tablets revolutionized dishwashing to bring you outstanding cleaning results. And our best just got better. Because now, there's a plus. New extra powerful enzymes in the blue layer mean even the toughest baked on food is broken down more easily. So the white layer can clean to an unbeatable shine. Isn't it time you tried new Finnish Double Action Plus? Because our best just got better. With Wolfe Tone's death, the Irish involvement with revolutionary France ended. But what might have happened if the Bantry expedition two years earlier had made land? If the French had landed in 1796, and if Osh, the general in charge, had been among those who landed, there's little doubt that they could probably have beaten the British army in Ireland. I think it's fairly certain they would have reached Cork very quickly and that they would have gone from there to Dublin. And I think that it would have been quite difficult for the British to hold on. And yet the experience of French conquest elsewhere in Europe suggests that the warmth of the Irish welcome for the French might well have cooled. I think that Ireland could have looked forward to a fairly strict military controlled regime, at least until the conclusion of a, of a general peace. And there's every evidence to suggest that armies are not particularly good at persuading populations to cooperate with them. And in the German Rhineland, as well as in Belgium, we know there was a great deal of pillage and of looting and of theft and of drunkenness and poor behaviour, which caused bitter hostility on the part of those populations. The French were largely rejected wherever they went in the 1790s, and there's very little evidence to suggest that it would have been uh, otherwise um, in Ireland. So the French might well have taken Ireland from the British, but in the fortunes of war and diplomacy, they might equally well have handed Ireland back, as long as the price was right. Ireland would have been given back to Britain if France had to, had to draw up a compromise peace. Britain wouldn't have let go of Ireland uh, easily. Uh, Ireland was too important for British strategic interests to let go easily. So it would have to have been an almost complete defeat of Britain. For, Ireland to be, uh, for Britain to abandon Ireland. France, on the other hand, although she was interested in liberating other people, would have regarded Ireland as a strategic pawn to use in a diplomatic negotiation to end the war. So much would have depended on the balance of power at the end of the war. In fact, the rebellion and the threat from France led Britain to impose an even closer control of Ireland. 
the British government had long considered direct rule. So the Prime Minister Pitt imposed the Act of Union. The Irish Parliament passed into history and the old regime of Protestant ascendancy went with it. Though the rebellion had failed utterly, it had altered the political landscape. The rebellion changed all. Republicanism had gone into the rebellion, I think, as a Protestant invention. It was something that Protestant thinkers, Wolf Tone, Nielsen, Drennan even, had in a set created or put forward. Republicanism came out of the rebellion, by and large, as a Catholic thing. From that point on, Catholicism and Republicanism and separatism seemed to be inextricably intertwined. And I think that was a major shift. As politics was changing, the record of history was also being reshaped. The truth about the rebellion of Ulstermen against the Crown was being quietly buried with the dead. And the radicalism of the Presbyterian Meeting House, the engine room of the whole reform movement, gave way to the new orthodoxy of the Ulster Orange Hall. The rebellion cast a long shadow before it. I think it's not too much to say that it, it, it determined Catholic and Protestant relationships for the remainder of the 19th century and beyond. So far as Antrim and Down were concerned, Presbyterians and the Anglicans who had fought one another at St. Field and Balna Hinch and at Antrim, in a sense buried their differences, just to an extent superficially, but the old Protestant consensus was once again established. And in this process, the Orange Order, its very existence was crucial because those Presbyterians who had sided with the United Irishmen could join the Orange Order and in a sense shed themselves of their rebel past, though not the rebel memory. The rebellion changed all. Nothing was ever the same again. The new loyalist histories wrote out the Protestant involvement in 98 and exaggerated the Catholic. Gone was the memory of Donegore Hill with Henry Joy McCracken and his 10,000 men. Of French revolutionary committees in County Antrim towns. Of thousands of men and women at Edna Vaddy preparing in their Sunday best for the Battle of Ballina Hinch. In the new Protestant orthodoxy, these things could not be spoken of. In their place was a simple, hateful Catholic event, a rebellion directed against Protestants by popish hordes, brimming with atrocities and doomed to fail. In the new loyalist revisionism, it was a priest-led rebellion, pure and simple. In fact, the Catholic Church had been wholly opposed to the rebellion. It was terrified of the anti-Catholic politics of France and convinced that moderation would bring Catholic relief. Archbishop Troy of Dublin and his hierarchy were deeply conservative. And the Bishop of Wexford, Dr. Caulfield, described the priests of his diocese who took part in the rebellion as the very feces of the church. And yet it was the Catholic Church which was to propagate the heroic image of the rebel priest. At cool of oak, as the sun was setting o'er the bright May meadows of Shelmalier. In the 1870s, the church was struggling with the Fenians for the hearts and minds of the people. A new version of history was needed, and with it, a new hero. 
Then Father Murphy from all Kilcormack spurred up the rocks with a warning cry. Armorn, he cried, for I've come to lead you for Ireland's freedom. We'll fight or die. The writer of the new and hugely popular history was a Wexford Franciscan, Father Patrick Kavanagh. As the centenary approached, the leadership of the Great Uprising was being taken from Protestants and from political organisations and put into safer clerical hands. I think uh, the legend of 98 has exaggerated the uh, importance and the prowess of Father Murphy. He was an important figure. He was one of, I would say, a dozen important figures. And there are a few moments when he plays a particularly important role. He happened to be leading the small rebel company that uh, encountered Bucky's regiment at the Harrow on the night of the rebel mobilization. I think we have to remember that that was not really uh, the spark that caused the rebellion to break out in Wexford. It was, it was breaking out anyway. Father Murphy and his group of 20 or 30 men happened to run into a patrol. He's very important, I think, at the Battle of Owlert Hill. He's one of maybe three or four leaders who conduct that battle. He's not the leader of the battle at, the, at Owlert Hill. Father Murphy, I think we can say, is one of perhaps half a dozen men who basically lead by committee. He is not, however, the central figure to the rebellion in Wexford and certainly not in Ireland, in Ireland at large. But in song and story, the centenary version of the history took root and soon the rebellion had become very much a story of Wexford and pikes. The pikemen march again to the top of Vinegar Hill, the objective for which so many of their forefathers gave their lives. At Bowdenstown in Kildare, the grave of Theobald Wolftone became a place of pilgrimage for those wishing to claim direct political lineage. The one part of our country. but only those who died young passed into legend. Some, like the young Wexford rebel Miles Byrne, lived into old age, long enough to become a veteran of the French army and to be photographed as an old man in Paris in 1859. In the crypt of St. Werberg's in Dublin is another grave, which perhaps best measures the great fall from the bright hopes of the United Irishmen in 1791 to the carnage of the rebellion itself. Lord Edward Fitzgerald was a kind of a talismanic name. He dresses as a revolutionary, crops his hair in the revolutionary style. Here was somebody who had been in America, who had come back from France, who was born, if you like, to a, a gilded life. Who was willing to lend the enormous prestige of his name to the United Irish Project. Lord Edward is very young, he's very strong, and it takes him many days to die. If the rebellion has a monument, perhaps it's not at Bowdenstown or Vinegar Hill, but here. William Drennan, founder of the United Irishman, wrote, 
Independence shot past him in letters of light, then the scroll seemed to shrivel and vanish in night. All the illumined horizon became, in the shift of a moment, a darkness, a dream. When I think about 1798, and I grew up in a place where it certainly um, was very important, the first thing that I think now uh, is that 1798 was a tragedy. Um, it, it was certainly not something that I think we ought to think about in celebratory terms. Um, I have to say now at this point in my life, having studied it for a while, that Ireland would have been a lot better off had 1798 never happened. Uh, I say that because the ideals for which the United Irishmen decided to fight were, were wonderful ideals, and we live by them now in most of the Western world. But they decided to fight. Now, certainly they were fighting in the context of a time, the time of the French Revolution, when it seemed that rebellion worked. Um, and it's, it's, it's harsh of us to judge them morally, certainly, for making this decision. But nonetheless, the, the United Irishmen launched a war and we can't forget that. And at the end of that war, tens of thousands of people were dead, who would otherwise have lived, we presume, normal lives. So 98, in, for me, in Wexford, uh, 98 in Ireland generally, is a, is a tragic event, and a very unfortunate event, and a very dark thing. In the 98 rebellion, there was bravery. Um, there were some very courageous people on both sides, let it be said. There was also brutality. There were all of the things that go along with warfare. But war is a, war is a serious business. And I think when we attempt to commemorate wars that have taken place in the past, we have to be very, very serious about it and very, very careful how we do it. And so when I look back on this rebellion, when I look back on this conflict, um, I look back on it uh, much more uh, sadly, I think, much more somberly than I would have done when I was younger growing up in a place like this. An RTE publication to accompany this series is now available from bookshops nationwide.